by um, PHP, which is called the Functional Diversity and Redundancy of Corals, supervised by Terry and Mia. So most people now accept that uh, coral reefs are going to continue changing and are instead focusing their attention towards the preservation of ecological functions. Uh, and so in a recent review, Terry and others uh, said that the global challenge is to steer reefs through the Anthropocene era in a way that maintains their biological functions. And so I think some of the most important questions that we can ask are, can we quantify the diversity of functional roles across, across different regions? How is this diversity going to be affected by climate change? Can redundant species replace those in decline and then potentially maintain ecosystem functions? And how do traits or trait diversity actually influence reef functions? So my thesis is focused on corals. And corals are an extremely diverse group. And they have a range of morphological, physiological, uh, and life history traits. And this means that they have a range of potential influences on ecosystem functions. And this is what we call functional trait diversity or just functional diversity. Uh, a growing body of evidence suggests that trait diversity is good for ecosystems. So every one of these three figures says the same thing. And that's that uh, a larger mix of traits along the x-axis is good for an ecosystem function along the y-axis. And this is common across different systems. So this one looks at suspension feeding and streams and found that the level of suspension feeding was higher in mixtures than it was in monocultures. This one's from grasslands, which shows that an increasing number of functional groups leads to a higher level of biomass production. Uh, and this one is from invertebrate communities and soils, which shows that a greater functional dissimilarity between species leads to a higher rate of decomposition. So diversity is good, but what's the opposite of diversity? Similarity. Uh, now, this every one of the creatures in this diagram is a different species, and so it highlights the high amount of similarity that you can get in ecosystems. Now, each one of the species in the columns has a uh, similar set of traits, and therefore a potentially similar influence on ecosystem function, and this is what we call functional redundancy. So, research suggests that re redundancy can also be good for ecosystems, because it can stabilize ecosystem functions through time. And this can happen if the loss of one species is compensated by the persistence of another. Uh, and this is a phenomenon we call response diversity. The most familiar example to you is probably the maintenance of um, herbivory by sea urchins following the decline of parrotfish. But there are other examples across the world, uh, including pollinators in New Zealand, uh, with the introduction of the exotic species, and uh, seed disperses in Costa Rica, in Costa Rican birds. So redundancy is good for ecosystems. But as Dave Bellwood has said, redundancy shouldn't help you sleep better at night. Mm -hmm. And that's because there are still many unique species out there with no redundancy. So this is an analysis of um, reef fish led by Dave Moyer. Um, and it identified 646 trait-based groups of fish for over 6,000 species, and this is for the Indo-Pacific. Now this graph shows the number of species per group ranked from highest to lowest. And so what you'll notice is that most of the species are, are found in just a few of the groups. And some species, these ones down here, are represented by just a single species. So uh, these are unique species with no functional analogues. Things like the um, boa medipon or bump head parrotfish, which um, Dave Bell has talked about. Um, so, right, just to recap a trait is some morphological or physiological feature that's expressed in the phenotype of an organism. The term functional means that that trait is important for something often at the community or ecosystem level. Trait diversity is the dissimilarity of traits in a community and functional trait redundancy is the similarity. Uh, and both of these can be good for ecosystems. So the next question is how do we measure this for corals? We know that corals are important for a range of ecosystem functions, such as carbonate framework accretion, the provision of habitat to fish and invertebrates. They modify the local conditions, such as flow. They fix carbon through primary production. They're important for the storage and cycling of nutrients, 
They have important trophic interactions like feeding on plankton or um, getting eaten by paralysis. Um They're important for reef connectivity through larval dispersal and potentially many others. So which one of these you're most interested in often depends on your motivation. Uh, if you're a geologist, you're most interested in this one. If you like fish, you're most interested in this one. Um, and what we wanted to do was try to quantify this multifaceted view of coral functional roles. Uh, so I looked at traits, and traits have a very long history, um, and, which, and people have been thinking about the importance of traits for ecosystem functions for decades, possibly even centuries. Um, if you go back to, um, to Charles Darwin's Coral Reef book, you can find an interesting passage on the importance of uh, growth rates for reef formation. People like Garreau talked about the importance of carbonate accretion for framework building roles and identified three potential roles, including um, builders, fillers, and cementers. Um, Jeremy Jackson identified important dimensions of morphology and talked about their importance for the life history and community dynamics. Uh, and many authors have looked at the importance of different aspects of morphology for the provision of habitat to uh, fish and vertebrates. The question is, how do we collate this information into a concise framework for the analysis of functional roles? Um, well, we took a bit of inspiration from plants, which have identified key sources of trait variation, such as height, leaf area, seed mass, leaf mass, and woodiness. Um, and each of these images shows the two extremes. So there's a large amount of trait variation, and the way they often express it is through what we call a trait space. This is an ordination of species, the points, by their traits, the vectors, um, using something like a principal components analysis. In this case, the distance between the points or the species is some measure of their functional dissimilarity, whilst their closeness is a, is a measure of their similarity. So this is a, a pretty cool example from uh, Diaz. Um, and, it's like, and she's identified these important um, uh, axes of trait variation. And also they found that these axes are consistent across different biogeographical regions. So those, those are, uh, are the colors, Argentina, England, Iran, and Spain. You can see um, species are distributed according to their functional dissimilarity. There's overlap among different regions. And there are certain areas of trait space which are only found in one region, the capital of Argentina. Um, so we wanted to work on this for corals. So this brings me back to my aims. Um, we wanted to build on these ideas of functional diversity and functional redundancy and trait space to answer some of these questions. So each one of these questions translates into a chapter of my thesis. The first chapter is on global patterns of functional diversity and redundancy. The second chapter is on how mass bleaching transforms coral trait composition. Third chapter is, how, is looking at long-term loss versus maintenance of functional diversity, to so see if we can look for that um, redundancy and response diversity. And chapter four is on the influence of traits or trait diversity on community productivity. So I'll start with chapter one. Uh, and uh, in this chapter, we explored global patterns of coral functional diversity and redundancy. So our understanding of global variation in reef diversity is still emerging. And early work by Stelly and Wells found contours of decreasing diversity at an increasing distance from the Indo-Pacific hotspot. We now know that phylogenetic diversity, or evolutionary diversity, is also highest in this hotspot. What about functional diversity? Well, not much has happened since this key paper by um, Dave Bellwood and Terry, which compared the numbers of species <coughs> representing key functional groups on the Great Barrier Reef in white and the Caribbean in black, and found that there were far greater numbers of species representing each group on the Great Barrier Reef. We wanted to build on this using trait spaces. Um, and for our, so for our trait space of corals, we looked at growth, colony size, polyp size, branch spacing and height, <coughs> tissue area, and skeletal density. And again, each of these um, images is supposed to show the two extremes. Um, the reason why we focused on these traits is because we hypothesized that they were important for ecosystem functions, such as framework accretion, habitat provision, and productivity. 
We got data from the Coral Traits database, and we used an infilling approach to fill in gaps in the data defined by um, Josh Maiden, uh, in which we use a combination of phylogeny, morphology, and, and expert opinion. So we did a principal components analysis on these traits for every all one of our 800 species. Uh, and this created the global boundaries of trait space, that's the grey line. And you can see that um, there's two key axes of correlated trait variation, and these are the, are the traits that are associating with each axis. And each coordinate in this space represents a different trait combination. This it figure shows the occupancy of that trait space across different biogeographical regions. So we focused on 12 regions, um, which were defined in a previous paper by Salaki. The, um, the colours indicate um, which trait space they refer to. And um, if, there's a, if, a, if a blob is coloured in one of these figures, it means that species is present. If it's not coloured, it means that species is absent. So what you'll see is that the occupancy of trait space, or trait diversity, is very consistent across a broad range of region, regions, spanning from the Red Sea, to Polynesia. This breaks down when you start to look at more the corporate provinces, such as Hawaii, uh, the East Pacific, and the Caribbean, where there's fewer, a, a, a smaller range of traits, a smaller trait diversity, um, and a potentially depleted trait composition. What we did was plot this occupancy of trait space on the y-axis against species richness. Um, on the x-axis. Um, and this is, this, so each of the points in this uh, diagram is the, it represents one of the 12 provinces, um, and you can see Atlantic provinces down here, uh, and Indo-Pacific provinces. What, we've, what it shows is an asymptotic increase in functional diversity with species richness. What that means is that as you initially increase species richness, you get a rapid increase in trait diversity, as every species you add provides some sort of new trait or new function. This then levels out once you get to the Indo-Pacific, as there are fewer new trait combinations added by each species, and more and more accumulation of redundancy. We also measured something called neighbour dissimilarity, which is the distance between each species and its closest neighbours in trait space, as a measure of redundancy. How, how much does that species have a similar functional analogue? We found a, a decreasing, um, species, a decreasing dissimilarity with species richness indicating that species were increasingly packed into trait space, into tighter clusters. I just want to draw your attention as well to this red line. This red line shows the single species groups. So we actually split trait tra split tra space up into 80 groups and thought about uh, and analyzed the proportion of, of groups in that region that were represented only by a single species. You can see that it goes down in a similar way to the neighbor dissimilarity. But it doesn't go down to zero. So despite, this, despite these regions, the Great Barrier Reef and the Indo-Pacific being extremely diverse, there's still about 20% of species which are represented only by, uh, sorry, 20% of clusters, trait groups, represented by just a single species. We wanted to explore this um, concept of redundancy a little bit more, uh, and so, we looked a little bit more closely at trait space, uh, and this is a hypothetical trait space. And you've got clusters of similar species, these are the points, and um, a, one highly unique species. So we could split this trait space up like this to look at the numbers of species representing each area of the trait space. We can find four single clusters, but that still means that this cluster is uh, considered the same as these when this cluster is really the most unique and the most, um, the, the most valuable and the one that you wouldn't want to lose, um, otherwise you'll lose a large area of trade space. Um, and so we wanted to um, look at this uh, concept in more detail. And this is what happens when you analyze quantitative traits, you get this sort of continuum of similarity. So we looked in a bit more detail at the Caribbean and the Great Barrier Reef. Caribbean's in orange and the Great Barrier Reef is in blue. Um, each point is a species, as I said before, um, and you can see there's a large amount of overlap. The Great Barrier Reef and the Caribbean have similar, um, have a range of similar functional roles in common. Um, 
The other striking thing that you'll notice is that this area of trade space is quite depleted in the, Carib in the Caribbean. So there's a cluster that the contours, by the way, show high density or high areas of high similarity. Um, you can see this cluster here is re well represented in both regions. Well, this cluster here, which is tables um, and bushy corals, is, a, is missing in the Caribbean. This cluster here is represented by a range of different species on the Great Barrier Reef, but um, in the Caribbean there's only three, and those are the three Acropora species. Acropora palmata, Acropora cervicorinus, and Acropora prolif. Um, so we can actually plot this um, in, as well by using these contour plots. Um, and this, so we're now analyzing those contours of high density separately for both the Caribbean and the Great Barrier Reef. And you can sort of imagine this as a, 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 lands, a landscape of redundancy um, where the peaks indicate the highest areas of density um, or similarity. And the first thing you'll notice is that there's low redundancy in these very large areas of trade space. Meanwhile, in the Great Barrier Reef, there are at least three hotspots of functional redundancy. Um, so I haven't quite found a way to put this into numbers yet. Um, this is sort of just conceptual, but um, I've got some ideas. Um, we also try to look at response diversity. So this figure shows the, shows the presence of both brooders and spawners in the different regions. The reason why we focused on that group is because brooders and spawners have different patterns of dispersal, dis different dispersal distances, and potentially different rates of recruitment, um, and also potentially different responses to the surface. So um, what you'll see is that brooders and spawners are distributed across widely across the Great Barrier Reef trade space. So there's a diversity of recruitment strategies among lots of different functional groups. In the Caribbean, some groups are only represented by brooders and some only by spawners. So this might potentially limit response diversity. All right, to sum up chapter one, biodiversity hotspots contain the greatest variety of coral forms and functions and show the greatest propensity for redundancy or resilience. Unique or low redundancy species exist in all regions but species poor regions are exceptionally vulnerable because just a few species occupy large areas of trade space. So in other words, if this sort of redundancy keeps you awake at night, then this sort of redundancy should give you nightmares or something. <laughs> um, all right, moving on to chapter two, in which I looked at how mass bleaching transforms coral trait composition. So most of you will be familiar with this figure, which shows a high level of bleaching in 2016 in the northern half of the Great Barrier Reef. I was sent out um, to survey reefs underwater between um, Cooktown and Cairns. And these are some of the images behind this, this data um, taken by myself and the people I was with. And you can see a high level of extensive bleaching in this region. Something else we did was we went back to the reefs we visited six months after the bleaching. So this shows the, um, the uh, this is River Reef 8 during bleaching, and the same reef um, six months later. Um, what we did with this information was me measure the change in coral cover across the Great Barrier Reef, which looks exactly the same as the pattern of bleaching, and also the shift in composition. What you'll <coughs> notice is that most of the Acropora, the bushy Acropora on the top, is dead in this figure. That's why it's turned brown, whilst this Thing, brown thing here, which is a fabid, is, is still going. So there's also been this shift in species composition, and we wanted to sort of estimate the functional consequences of that. So what we did was plot assemblages according to the abundances of different traits. So we used the same traits as I did in chapter one. And what we did was give a value of each, for each trait to the assemblages. So if an assemblage is dominated by species with high surface area, it gets a high value for surface area. Um, and then we did a multi-dimensional scaling analysis of these values for all the traits. And um, so reefs are plotted in this space according to the abundance of particular traits, species with particular traits. What I want you to focus on is this area here, because this area is where species, the reefs are dominated by species with high surface areas, fast growth rates large colony sizes and high branch spacing. This figure here shows 
the positions of the assemblages before the bleaching in grey and after light or moderate bleaching in blue. And you can see the shifts are relatively small and they've largely gone towards this key area of, of high functional diversity. This is contrasted by reefs which experienced high levels of bleaching, which largely shifted away from that key area um, towards a more functionally depleted assemblage. What um, Terry and James Perry and the people at NOAA were able to do was to look at how this, these, this response varies with heat exposure. So we plotted the shift in taxonomic or functional composition. And this is measured as the distance um, the assemblage has traveled in that trait space or the, the taxonomic space, so the length of the arrows, against heat exposure measured in degree heat in the weeks. And you can find this increase in the shift in functional or taxonomic composition with heat and this threshold at about six degree heating weeks. So to conclude that, mass bleaching poses a fundamental threat to ecological functions. And there's been a region-wide shift away from fast-growing tabular and branching species. Towards a more depleted assemblage with, assemblage with simpler morphological traits and slow growth. So that's all I'm going to say about bleaching. But I wanted to move on to chapter three, which looks at a more long-term shift in functional trait diversity. So while the bleaching analysis um, focuses on a single disturbance, we wanted to look at how reefs might change following disturbance and recovery. What we're interested in is whether the loss of taxa leads to a loss of functional diversity, or whether certain taxa may be able to replace them and maintain ecological functions. So, as I said, the advantage of using this long-term data is that you can focus on both disturbance and recovery. And we looked at primarily at case studies from three regions, the Great Barrier Reef, Polynesia, and Jamaica. This figure shows coral cover through time, coral cover along the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and you can see some of the data sets go back to before the 1980s. You can also see that each of these reefs um, tells a different story. In Jamaica, there was a collapse of coral cover, which was um, persistent, and since then there's been a partial recovery of coral cover. And most of, that's because most of these reefs in Jamaica are now dominated by macroalgae. In Polynesia, there's been two cycles of disturbance and recovery. Um, and each recovery in these regions has taken about 10 years. On the Great Barrier Reef, the data starts a little bit later, but we've got still one cycle of disturbance and recovery, which we can look at. So what I want you to focus on in these figures is the three points, uh, one, two, and three, one, two, and three. These are key time points representing pre-disturbance, so the assemblages before they got disturbed, immediately after, and the recovering assemblages. We analyze functional diversity at each of these time points. And unlike chapter one, we measured functional diversity using a, an abundance-weighted metric called browse Q. So unlike chapter one, which was focused just on presence or absence, this one's actually got incorporates some analysis of abundance. So if a highly abundant species is distributed across broad areas of trade space, that equals a high functional diversity. If, just a, if abundance is concentrated into just a few species or a small area of trade space, that's a low functional diversity. What you'll see, first of all, is that these results are consistent with chapter one in that the Great Barrier Reef has the highest functional diversity, Polynesia a little bit lower, <coughs> Jamaica a little bit lower. The next thing you'll notice is that functional diversity decreases following disturbance and also following recovery. So un what we'd expect if things were normal would be for functional diversity to bounce back um, if all the taxa came back in the same way. Instead what's happened is that species have been funneled into smaller areas of trade states leading to this lower functional diversity. What it represents is a 34% loss of functional diversity. So we're looking, talking about the original versus the recovering assemblages. 34% loss in the Great Barrier Reef, 30% loss in Polynesia, and 64% loss in Jamaica. And you can just hear that some people aren't very happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, there's been this loss of functional diversity despite reco recovery. So these two assemblages, you'll remember, recovery, rec um, coral cover has bounced back 
and this is on its way back. So coral cover may not be the best estimate of, of ecosystem functions. We wanted to expand this data um, to look at whether can we identify functionally similar species that are potentially responding differently to disturbance and recovery. And I just wanted to show you this picture. It's not very visible, but um, well, this is during this is six months after the bleaching, and you can see dotted around these dead corals, but also there's live corals immediately next to them um, that are functionally very similar, perhaps even the same species. Uh, and more people are getting interested in why this is happening. So we measured response diversity by looking at trait space again. Um, and so this is our trait space, and it's based on the same traits that I've been looking at in chapters one and two. Uh, and you can see the position for each of the traits um, it, it distributed around trait space. And also, species are distributed according to their morphologies, and those are the black points. What we looked at was whether species increased or decreased follows dis following disturbance and recovery in trait space. Essentially, we're looking at winners and losers. Did each species did species increase in absolute abundance or decrease? Um, this is for Jamaica. The blobs show the size of the increase for winners or decrease for losers. The occupancy shows how much winners and losers are distributed in in trait space. Um, and the lines connect each of the winners or losers to their centroid. Um, so we're looking for sort of differences between these centroids. And also, are two blobs, are two a grey and a red blob cl closely together? Because if they are, that means they're functionally similar. Oops. They're functionally similar, um, but they responded differently. So we're looking. For, that's what we're looking for. You can see in Jamaica it hasn't happened. The losers are distributed across a very broad areas of trait space. These are species that are decreased in abundance, and there's nothing that's coming back to replace their functions. Instead, the, the species that are coming back are found in this tiny corner of trait space here, which are sort of the submassive mounds. Um, the story is a little bit different in Polynesia. There is a bit of overlap between the functional overlap between the species that are increasing and decreasing. In particular, what's, there's something interesting going on here, which is the tabular or bushy corals. And you can see that two species, the Acroporas, have decreased in abundance. And one species is bouncing back and actually increased in abundance to replace them. This is that's possible for them. So this, in my opinion, is response diversity. We've got functionally similar species in a, in a small area of trait space that are responding differently to the stresses. Having said that, there are certain areas of trait space which have been lost um, without recovery. On the Great Barrier Reef, there's also something interesting going on, and that's that the species that are increasing in abundance and decreasing in abundance are equally diverse, but they're sort of separating out into two distinct groups. And you can almost imagine this as a sort of test of the two means and the variance to see if they overlap. Um, these represent large and long-lived species, like um, large mounds, and these are the um, bushy corals and tables. So we're sort of seeing a, a, a loss without recovery of these long-lived species, um, and leading to a, a, an assemblage dominated by uh, weedy corals like tables. Um, so I think that's one of the key results of this: is that we can't see long we can't see response diversity on these decadal timescales among the most long-lived species. So, in conclusion, functionally similar species can respond differently to recurrent disturbance and potentially maintain functions. But many areas of trait space have been lost with no replacement by functionally similar species. And this has led to a loss of functional diversity despite recovery at all locations. Um, and by recovery, I mean complete or partial recovery. Okay, on to chapter four. In this one, we looked at the influence of traits or trait diversity on community productivity. So we looked at productivity because we thought it was, we thought it was an important function underlying other functions such as calcification and habitat construction. I wanted to bring you back to this figure, uh, which you've seen before, which shows um, an, a higher level of an ecosystem function with an increasingly diverse mixture of traits. Um, and I want to bring your attention specifically to this figure, um, which is looking at suspension feeding in stream invertebrates. 
we, I've, we, I showed you before that they, uh, there's a higher level of suspension feeding in mixtures than in monocultures. But what these authors did critically was to compare what you would expect the mixture to form like given the monocultures and the actually observed suspension feeding. So in other words, they said which species are actually present um, in, in the mixtures. How did they perform in monocultures and therefore how should we expect them to perform in mixtures? And this increase here in, in what you would expect versus what you've observed is what we call the diversity effect. Something about diversity is helping these species perform better. So this hasn't been analyzed for corals. Uh, and so we've set up experimental coral assemblages in flumes with varying species composition. And in particular, we looked at the difference between eight monocultures and 16 mixed assemblages of species or multi-species assemblages. The communities were composed of different combinations of these eight species, which are common um, on, um, in shallow water on the reef. Um, we, looked, we calculated productivity using O2 respirometry, and we looked at two flow speeds, three and a half and seven centimeters a second. The, the, at first, I'm gonna show you results just from high flow. Um, what we found, similar to what they found in stream communities, was this higher level of um, ecosystem function in mixtures when compared to monocultures. So uh, on the y-axis, you've got productivity. Uh, and on the x-axis, you've got monocultures versus mixtures. And monocultures are shown with the identity of each assemblage. This shows what we'd expect the mixtures to form like, given the performance of monocultures. And this shows the, what we actually observed. And so we found this diversity effect. Something about diversity was making a higher level of productivity in mixtures. So we wanted to explore this a little bit further. And one of the things we were interested in testing was the importance of traits in predicting the function. So we looked at a key trait, surface area, at a colony scale, so colony surface area. Um, and we measured that using 3D photogrammetry. What you'll see is that for individual coral colonies, there's a, an increase in productivity and a fairly good relationship between this trait and this function. So this is a good sort of trait-function relationship. The same is true if you look at the communities of monoculture. So if you just look at single species communities and the, the relationship between total surface area and total productivity, there's quite a good relationship between, um, between surface area and productivity. Um, this, it's not, this isn't true, however, if you look at mixtures, where productivity is mostly larger than what you'd expect based on surface area, and considerably more variable. So this shows that there's been a distortion of the trait-function relationship in mixtures. Another thing we did was look at interactions that are potentially going on inside uh, our flumes. And the way we did that was to compare the performance of colonies on their own in flumes and the performance of colonies in groups to see how they're affected by those neighboring corals. So this is another trait space. And this shows uh, the positions in trait space of our, eight, of our eight species according to their morphological traits. This figure shows the trait space with the eight species and the lines connecting them show the interactions that are going on between um, the different species. So what we found was that there are both negative and positive interactions in mixtures. In other words, some species performed worse when they were put, in, put into the groups rather than in, in, in isolation. And some species performed better in the groups than they did in isolation. Um, and you can see this varied uh, based on which species was interacting with which. Something strange we also found was that, as I said, all, this, all these results so far are in a single flow rate, seven, seven centimeters a second. When we turned down the flow to half the flow rate, three and a half, there was no positive interactions, and all the interactions were negative. All the colonies performed worse in the group than they did in isolation. So something about flow was creating this interesting diversity effect. And what we found was that when we reduced flow um, to half the level, the diversity effect, the difference between what, what we observed in mixtures and what we'd expect based on monocultures, was reduced. So there was a, a, a much smaller diversity effect under low flow. What we also found was that when we looked at potential traits that are explaining this high um, productivity, we found that flow sensitivity of colonies was key. So 
the, the amount that a colony increased or decreased in productivity when you changed flow was measured as their flow sensitivity. Uh, and that's the community flow sensitivity is on the y, the x-axis. These interactions, both positive and negative, uh, are on the y-axis. And you can see there's a positive relationship. The higher, the more sensitive colonies are to flow, the more likely they, they are to benefit from these neighbours. So, to conclude that, neighbour diversity and identity matters for coral community functioning. Uh, and the negative or beneficial effect of these neighbours um, is highly dependent on flow. Um, we're quite excited or interested by these results because there are comparable observations in other systems, um, including plants. So um, this, axis, this graph shows the, uh, an increasing diversity of species in a plantation. And there's that actual minus expected. How much does mixtures actually outperform what you'd expect of them depend, based on their monocultures? So there's a very limited effect of diversity under control conditions, under normal conditions. When you provide a drought to these communities, there is a benefit of diversity. And that's because these plants that are more susceptible to drought actually benefit from others that are, are um, less susceptible, which actually maintain the humid, or regulate the humidity and, and increase their performance. And that's very similar to what we found in our corals, where uh, flow-sensitive taxa uh, benefited from their neighbours. Okay, so um, leading on to my general discussion. What have we found throughout this thesis? Coral diversity and identity are important for functions. But this diversity is changing rapidly at both local and regional scales. Redundancy can help maintain functions through time, but it's limited by low species richness and potentially low response diversity if the stresses are too large. <coughs> Um, and this is a sort of summary statement of my thesis. Um, future trajectories in the functioning of reefs will depend on how different biogeographical pools of distinctive and redundant species will reassemble in the wake of global warming. Um, and each of those things re re relates to a chapter, so sort of a 12-second thesis. Um, <laughs> what's next? Well, we need to take a look at um, abundance and see how species functional roles are actually influenced by how abundant they are. Uh, the functional impact of a species should be um, regulated by abundance. So that might affect where the asymptote is or where functional diversity is highest in, uh, across different regions. We also need to look at phylogeny because phylogeny is good at answering the why question. Why is functional diversity highest in this region? Why are these traits associated with each other? Um, and so on. Our analysis of redundancy needs to look at intraspecific trait diversity. So all the trait spaces I showed you are based on a mean for each of species. So it's just a point. But really, species have a wide range of varial variation of traits, and therefore occupy sort of spheres in trait space rather than points. Uh, and this can help analyze redundancy, because we can see if there's overlap between different species in their functional roles driven by intraspecific trait variability. Chapter 4 showed that we need to focus more on trait function relationships because it, it seems as though the influence of key traits can be distorted by species interactions and environmental conditions. Uh, and finally, I like this idea of response and effect traits. Um, response traits influence a species' response to environmental change, whilst effect traits determine a species' in, impact on ecosystem function. And this can facilitate predictions on the climate change uh, and it's been described as the holy grail of trait-based ecology. Um, each chapter has resulted in a publication. Um, the first two are published. This one's in preparation, and this one's in review. The, uh, there's also two, um, at least two, I hope, um, publications associated with the thesis. And that's all, and thank you to my supervisors, uh, collaborators, Coltrex database, the yeah, everyone who runs the center, and friends, family, and Molly. Thank you. Thank you.